Yeah, one of the things that was so cool about uh, getting uh, some time with Tyler was uh, he's going to do the, talk to the kids now, by the way. But one of the things that's so cool about that is when I realized that he, he could bench 500, I realized, well, he and I could probably work out together. And, um, you know, he would just have to take a little off, you know, when he had to lift and stuff. So we started doing that now. It's kind of been a, a good thing for us. <clears throat> uh, hey, you know, uh, I was thinking about this this, this week. You know, I, I want to give you some terminology to describe your life. And I know that's a pretty bold, audacious kind of claim. And so I want you to know I don't take that. I don't say it lightly. But I really believe what I'm getting ready to say, uh, this will describe the dynamic involved in your life. And that is this. All of our lives is this somehow this deal that we're trying to figure out to the best possible way to get from whatever the here is to whatever the there is. And so all of life becomes about trying to figure out how do we get from here to there. And I'll prove this to you. If you throw your kids in a car, responsibly in seatbelts and all that junk, if you throw your kids in a car and you say, we got an eight-hour trip to Virginia, and you get to easily, what are they going to ask? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? That's what they're going to ask. And here's what I want you to know. As obnoxious as that is, as troubling as that is to hear that question, all of us are still asking the exact same question in this room. <laughs> We're all trying to figure out how do we get from a certain here to a certain there. And so we all try to figure out, well, how can I become employed along the way? And so we think, well, this is my here. I'm currently unemployed, or maybe I don't have an education, or don't have a job, and I want to get there. I want to be employed. I want to have a job. Some of us in the room are thinking, I'm currently single, and I don't want to be single for all of my life. I want to get there. I want to be married. Some of us are thinking, well, I don't have any children. My here is, we don't have children right now, and I really love to have children. That's my there. Then there are those of us that, that have children, and we would think, man, I would love, well, never mind. We don't want to talk about that. That's just not, not a, that, that's not relevant. Uh, finances, you know, think, man, finances, we're, we're just covered up. I'm in debt, and if, if I had a there, I'd say, I want to get out of debt. I want to get out of debt. And so life becomes this defining thing somewhere between our here and are there. And then we kind of get a job. We say, I want to be uh, financially solid, you know, when, we, when I retire. And so that becomes all about trying to make a whole lot of money so you can be retired and retired well. And then you retire. <laughs> and you think, man, this is my here. I'm now retired. And you're there is kind of avoiding the ultimate there, right? <laughs> you're like, I don't want to end up going to where there is. And so all of life is this combination or this dynamic between here, here and there. And so when we talk about life and we talk about what we're doing with our one and only lives, that becomes kind of the, the terminology. And this is what this whole series is about. If we have a faith that's kind of anemic, it's kind of, kind of poor, it's really not solid, it's really not earth-shattering, how would we become the kind of person that had a faith that was rock-solid, the kind of person that didn't have any wavering at all? How would we become this person? That's what Transformers is all about, this whole series. And the way we've defined this kind of faith is this. What if we had absolute confidence, rock-solid, unshakable confidence that God is real and that God is personal and that God's always present? In other words, if I could take whatever, however I would define my faith right now, and I could somehow have a faith that would live with absolute certainty, believe with absolute certainty that God is real, God is personal and always present. How would that happen? And that's what's right here. And so we've been talking about what's right here. Practical teaching we talked about. Uh, providential relationships. And today, I want to talk about one. I'm just going to warn you, this is not going to be Feel Good Sunday. You will all avoid me on the way out of the room today, okay? Everyone's going to kind of shoot around a corner because this is uncomfortable. We're getting ready to get uncomfortable together, okay? Hello? Hello? Wait, wait. now I'm uncomfortable. Are you with me? We're getting ready to get a little uncomfortable because this is what we're going to talk about. One of the ways that we can get from here to there, one of the ways that you and I can develop a kind of rock-solid faith, God is real, God is personal, God is always present. Ready? is through private disciplines, is through private disciplines. And as soon as I say the word disciplines, there's this corporate groan across the congregation, right? Like, man, you gotta be kidding me. We're gonna talk about disciplines. Disciplines are those things that I know I ought to do, but I don't want to do. 
I ought to drink less coffee, but I don't want to. I ought not, which is great English, not eat ice cream at night, but I want to. I ought to spend more time with my family, but I don't like my family. I ought to spend more time dating your spouse. I don't want to date my spouse. I ought to put money away in savings. I don't want to put money away. It's all these, I ought to exercise. I don't want to exercise. And so there's all these disciplines that we kind of just think, man, these are things we ought to do, but we don't really want to do. Here's what I know about your life, and you can assume about mine. Everybody in this room has a specific set of disciplines you are currently employing and embracing to get you to whatever your there is. So even the things that are going on in your life that you're not a big fan of, some of those things are a direct result of your disciplines. Tom, I'm not connected to my family. Well, what are your disciplines? Well, I really enjoy watching TV from 8 to 11 o'clock every night. Uh, do, you, do you see that maybe that discipline might be producing something in your life you don't want? You follow me? Because the truth is, we could all be disciplined by something that is creating something in us that we don't even want. i, I give you a good example. The leader uh, was at the end of his reign. He's getting ready to, to kind of re- end this whole deal. He had impacted the world in a major way, but all of his followers had deserted him. He had nobody that stuck around with the exception of one person. He faced death, with an impact on the world. He faced death, though, almost completely alone with the exception of this one person. Most of his trustest and closest friends had already betrayed him. Some had fled. And the world scorned him, but not this one disciple. In fact, this one disciple said this. Um, Great joy. He greets me like an old friend and looks after me. How I love him. Then he speaks, how small am I? This disciple would remain faithful to him even to death, even following his leader to the grave. This disciple was greatly disciplined in the belief of this particular leader. He believed that this leader set the world's agenda and the right agenda for the world. And so he built a whole life around this, this follower. A little later on, the disciple penned these words about his leader. He said, when he speaks, all resistance breaks down before the magical effect of his words. One can only be his friend or his enemy. He divides the hot from the cold, but lukewarmness he spits out of his mouth. And the disciple's name was Joseph Goebbels, and he was a disciple of his Fuhrer Adolf Hitler. And while everybody else abandoned Hitler, Goebbels spent his last days alongside Hitler in Hitler's bunker. And when Hitler committed suicide, actually part of Hitler's will was that Goebbels was to take over the regime. But Goebbels wasn't going to be able to take over the regime because Goebbels and his wife, after killing their six children, ultimately committed suicide as well. My point for the story is this. Some of the disciplines that you and I are currently embracing in our life are producing a there we don't want. They're producing a there, you don't want to go there. Not all disciplines that we just let come into our lives are ones that we should keep in our lives. But maybe we should get intentional about the kind of disciplines and the things we're actually doing with this one and only life and ultimately how we want to get from a faith that is anemic, a faith that is bland, a faith that is not intrusive and not aggressive, to a faith that actually is rock-solid, world-changing kind of stuff. One thing we're going to look at today to do that is disciplines. Now, not in the sense of what we ought. I kind of redefined disciplines this week. See if you agree with this or like this or not. But when I think of disciplines, this is, this is what I think about. Disciplines create a culture in which I can be discipled in Jesus. Disciplines create a culture in which I can be discipled in Jesus. And so I'm not, it's not about me trying to figure out some kind of Um, way to kind of make myself more miserable. It's all about me trying to create a culture, an environment where Jesus trains me into who it is he wants me to be. Jesus teaches me. Now, there seems to be a trend in churches today that we don't like to talk about disciplines. We want to be able to come into a church like this, and we all want to sit in a room like this that's nice and dark, and we want to embrace grace and mercy in Jesus, and that's all wonderful, and it's all true. But let me make no mistake, Christianity is a disciplined faith. It is a, and I always get an email about this. I'm not talking about works righteousness. I am not. I'm talking about putting myself in a place where Jesus can speak to me. That's what I'm talking about doing. 
And if you are along this light of Christianity and along this ride and think, man, I want to be a person of faith, I want to be a person of... Listen, you will be a person of discipline. You will adopt, you will address disciplines that are part of your life that put you in a culture where you can be discipled in Jesus. Now, don't just take my word. Don't just take my word for this. Jesus actually taught about this, and he taught about it on the grandest stage that he had. His most famous sermon, Sermon on the Mount... Jesus is talking to the whole world about what the kingdom of God is like. And Jesus, in that sermon, says, here's some things about private disciplines. And in the discussion of private disciplines, I mean, what he talks about is huge, and it's going to be uncomfortable. But something he says, he repeats himself three different times in this passage. And normally if you're repeating yourself as a speaker, you've lost your spot and you're trying to find your place, but not Jesus, <laughs> Jesus does this three different times, and in so doing, he is going to communicate a massive point to us about private disciplines. Matthew chapter 6, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness, that's private disciplines, before people in order to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no, zero, zip reward from your Father in heaven. Now, this is the crucial connection that I want everybody in the room to understand. I want everybody there. Now listen, somewhere along the way today, you may find you're getting a little uncomfortable. And and if that's the case, I I want you to stay there. Be uncomfortable. I want you to wrestle with that because ask yourself, why are you uncomfortable? Some of the things we're going to talk about, I don't want to talk about. What Jesus is saying is this. Jesus makes a connection between your private discipline, here it comes, and God's reward. Don't take my word for this. Jesus makes a connection between your private discipline and God's reward. So when Jesus talks about discipline, he talks about three things. Money, prayer, and fasting. So at this point, we're going to play some music, and if you'd like to leave, we're going to kind of let everybody make this mass exit. I mean, I snuck you in here with Tyler, and then all of a sudden, money, tithing, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, I, and I, I'm sorry about that, but not, not real sorry, but I'm a little sorry about that. Jesus says in verse 2, when you give to needy people, don't announce it so everybody knows what you're doing. That's what hypocrite people do. But I tell you the truth, if they've done that, they've already received the reward. That's all they're going to get. People saw you give. Well done. Watch this. This is the most amazing truth. But when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Because then your giving is going to be done in secret. Listen. Then the Father, who sees what is done in secret, just might. Maybe. If he feels like it. No, 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 no. He will reward you. Please, please, please. All I just did was share with you what the maker of the world said. Those were Jesus' words, not mine. You don't even have to believe in me to get that. You don't have to believe anything I say. Jesus said, if you will will do this, if you will embrace this private discipline, you will be rewarded by your heavenly Father. By your heavenly Father. So right out of the gate, as we discuss the disciplines that create a culture in which we can be discipled, Jesus goes after a pocketbook. Jesus goes after money. Why in the world would he do that? Well, statistically, if we ask Jesus to come and share with us today, statistically, Jesus would talk about money. 11 of 39 parables talk about money. Jesus talked about money more than he talked about heaven and hell combined. Jesus talked about money more than any other topic with the exception of one, and that was the kingdom of God. Why in the world would Jesus come to the planet? Was he not sensitive to our culture and what we do? We don't talk about money. Why in the world would Jesus come to the planet and drive? You know why Jesus talked about money? You know why Jesus said that money's a big deal? Listen, you're not going. Money is always a mark of one's faith. Money's always a mark of somebody's faith. We don't give because we don't have enough faith, or we don't give because we don't have enough uh, to give away. It's always a mark of one thing. Money is the presenting issue, but it's not the real issue. It has nothing to do with money other than it's the presenting issue. The real issue is our belief that God is real, God is personal, and God is always present. Because if we believe that, we wouldn't fret over money. And Jesus knew that. 
We're all trusting God. What I've discovered this week is thinking about, I think we all trust God for everything that happens after this. Here's what I mean. Uh, we're all trusting God for what happens after we die. Like, okay, when I die, you know, I'm going to go to streets of gold and pearly gates and Jesus and wings and harps and all that's going to happen. is going to be wonderful. Why is it we trust God there? You know why? We have no other options. Yeah, Lord, all to you I surrender. I trust you completely because you're the only bus leaving town. You know, I'm going to be on it. <laughs> and so what we do as we live life here, we try to keep enough Christianese going in us, but ultimately it is this battle between trusting God and trusting my ability to do a better job than God. Trusting God with my money, but ultimately I want to trust myself and my ability to control and manage my money. Over and over and over again, Jesus teaches that from the point you die all the way back to where you are right now, you will have the temptation to trust your money more than you will have to trust God. And it's so true. I can give testimony to it, can't you? All the way from the time you die, all the way back to wherever it is we are in this, in this paradigm, you will fight the temptation to trust your money more than you trust God. That's why right out of the gate when Jesus talks about private disciplines, he says, hey, let's talk about money. Now, in our home, I just want to share this with you. This is not divinely inspired. Um, this is just, I felt, a moral obligation to say this is what we do. So if this is good for you, great. If it's not, then I respect that too. But in our home, the Harding home, we have to have a private discipline related to money. And it's not that complicated. It's been the same discipline for 25, 6 years now. It's the discipline we're teaching our children. And so it's basically this, and it's in this order, and it's never changed, just so you're aware. Even before I was in ministry, this was the whole deal. And as long as we've been followers of God, we've always believed that God asked and God wants a tithe. We don't believe anywhere in Scripture that that, that was ever, ever lifted. We believe that that's the minimum of what God would like for us to do. And so in our home, we take and we first check cut, always been that 10%. Now listen, I'm, honestly, it's a lot more comfortable now than it was back when we were in seminary and we were living in a little trailer and we were praying that our car would keep running and praying for gas in our car and we we're trying to find how to make ra ra Raymond ramen, ramen noodles creative again, you know, our hamburger helper. I mean, we we're doing the whole deal just like everybody else. But we still did the same thing. Now, why would you do that? You say, Tom, why in the world wouldn't you just go that night and get a steak instead of getting the 10%? Well, because we have a discipline related to our money and we wanted to create a culture in which we could be discipled to be like Jesus. And so it's always been the deal, whether we've had a little or whether we've had a lot. It's always been the same deal. Now, there's a lot of dynamics involved in this for me because I work here. And every once in a while, things will be going on here that I don't like. I know that's troubling to you, but that's still kind of what I feel. So I basically end up tithing where I work, which is an awkward piece. In fact, every once in a while, my human terms, my real human terms, I'll start thinking about what I could do with 25 years of tithe. You thought it was just you. I actually have those thoughts too. You know what I would have? I'd have a bigger house, and it would probably be paid for. I'd have some of them fancy countertops like some of you people have in your houses, you know, that I wish I could have, right? I'd have some of those too. I'd maybe have a couple dogs and extra dogs. I'd have a three or four cars, maybe some nice garages to put the cars in. I think I might like to have a boat. We have a boat now, but it's a canoe. <laughs> and we tried water skiing on it, but, you know, Lisa couldn't get the thing going. <laughs> I was thinking about all that stuff. I was like, man, you know, that's, I would have a bigger retirement. Honestly, my retirement would be larger. The money in my bank account would probably be larger than, than what I have right now. It really would. But I chose, Lisa and I chose back in the day, that money was not going to run our home. And so even when we didn't have it, we would cut the 10% tithe of check. Now, we're able to give more than that. But here's the thing I want you to know. Now, let me finish this out, then I'll tell you what I was going to tell you. 
The other thing we do is we do the 10%. This is early on, savings, and then we live off the rest. And that's just been the simple formula that we adopted when we were first married. Now, these things all have increased and changed over the years. But even when we couldn't do this, we still did this. Let me say something to you. Just listen. I've thought about this hard. I don't make this statement recklessly. This discipline has done more for my relationship with Jesus than any other discipline I have. And I have a bunch of them. I got a scripture reading discipline. I got a devotion reading discipline. I got prayer disciplines, all these things. This one has done more for our family and our faith than any other Christian discipline we have. We're now raising our children in it because Lisa pays the kids. I don't know why. Apparently, they do chores. I've just never seen them do it. <laughs> so they're, anyway, they got these chores they do, and so they get money. So whether it's a buck, because we don't pay them a lot, but whether it's a buck or whether it's, whether it's $1,000, it doesn't matter. It's the same discipline. 10%, 10%, 80 Why? We believe it's what the scriptures teach we're to do. And it's the way we keep money from being our God in our home. Now, on the times, during the times when I have been tempted to not follow this discipline, every time it has been a question of whether or not I had faith in God. Every time it was this temptation to take everything back where I could manage everything. If I could just not pay that, then I'm going to be able to do this. Or if I could not pay this, I'll be able to do this. And I'll justify this or I'll rationalize this. So here's my thing. If there's something inside of you right now that's kind of building up some resistance, ask yourself, why? Either I don't believe that that's what the Bible teaches, or I have a faith thing going on. So right when we're all a little uncomfortable, Jesus jumps into the next thing and he says, hey, listen, let me talk to you quickly about prayer. When you pray, um, don't do like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues on the street corners to be seen by people. I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is unseen. Watch it, here it comes. Then your Father, this is not maybe, possibly, then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. He will reward you. Jesus says it three times. Not maybe, not if you do it right. He will reward you. You know, I'm one of these economy of motion guys. What I mean by that is I'm trying to, because I have no brain, no life, but I'm trying to figure out in the, how can I accomplish as many things as possible with as little effort. So like in the bathroom, I'm like, <laughs> you wonder where this is going, don't you? But in the bathroom, I'm like, okay, how can I shave and I can brush my teeth and I can adjust the temperature on the thermostat or on the shower all at the same time with very minimal effort? Well, the same thing comes into my prayer life. Okay, if I got to pray, what could I be doing while I pray? So I could run, and maybe I could cook, and I could pray, and I could drive, and I could pray, and I could do all this other stuff while I'm praying, and pray and text at the same time. I could do all this kind of stuff. Well, that's not the prayer Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about a date. Jesus is talking about drive-by prayer or fast food prayer. Jesus is talking about spend time with me, just me and you, in prayer, private discipline. Now, thankfully for you, I can't go into the third discipline. But I can tell you what it is. Jesus said money, prayer, and then he said fasting. <laughs> now listen, if you're like me, and you wrestle with any of those three things, that's a faith problem. That is something that Jesus is trying to create in your faith world. But until you fully trust him, until you fully engage, you will not get from here to there. I was thinking about this week. It is very rare that when I decide I'm going to go for a run, that I lace up my shoes and I hit the pavement. And I think, man, this is great. In fact, the first half mile is my body yelling at me. 
for even moving on. What are you doing to me? You know, you're 46 years old. And then you're like, oh, football injury, you know, wrestling injury, basketball injury, all these things. Like, there's, there's nothing enjoyable about it at all. I don't understand you people at the runner's high. I start out with a runner's low, and I finish with a runner's low, okay? Never goes anywhere else. I get done. How was that? That was pure misery. Hope that never, if I could die tonight, it would be good. I don't want to ever do that again. But here's the thing. You know, even when my attitude is lousy, I still get the benefit of the discipline. Even when I run terrible and my attitude's terrible, when I finished, I still get the benefit. And that's what's kind of so cool about Christian disciplines to me. Even when I read the scripture and I think, man, I can't even remember what I read, I just finished. God's word never returns void. You still get the discipline, you still get the benefit of the discipline. Even when you pray and you feel like it didn't get past the ceiling, doesn't matter. You get the benefit of the discipline. And this benefit is this. God says, what you do in secret will be rewarded by your heavenly father. That's the benefit. What's the reward? Well, it's simple. Everybody gets Cadillacs. Everybody in the room, we get, we get fancy car. No, no. <laughs> no, this is the reward. Are you ready? You become more like Jesus. And as a result, your marriage becomes more Christ-like. Your relationships in your dorm become more Christ-like. Your children see Jesus in you, and it's modeled in your home. And ultimately what happens is your faith goes from wherever it is right now to something that you can only imagine as you think about what the Father's reward is for you. Now, what's really cool about this particular thing that God uses to grow our faith is this. It's all on you right now. You can do it right now. Um, this week, I was immersed in discipline stuff. So I bought a book. It's coming, it should be here Monday, that I'm going to add to my private disciplines because there's a piece of that book. There's something in me that I want, something that I want God to use in my faith. And you can do it right now. But this is what I ask you to do. Wrestle with this. Fight with this. Because the truth be told, some of us in this room are going to be very content with this kind of faith. That's just too intense. That's too radical, Tom. I don't want to... Well, that's, that's fine. Keep coming. Be part. But there's some of you in the room. And you know, just like we prayed for these kids... That God has placed something. You want to change the world. You want to change the world in the life of your friends. You want to see change in your marriage. You want to see change in your family. You want to see a neighborhood. You walk the neighborhood and your heart breaks because you know there are people in the neighborhood that don't know Jesus. If that's you, then I want to encourage you to embrace your private disciplines. Set up a couple. Say, I'm going to do this. Why? As my faith to the Lord and as a belief that my Father will reward me for my private disciplines. Lord, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for the high honor we have of being together and to discuss um, private disciplines this morning. And Lord, I'm, I'm just so aware, even as I bow my head here, that um, all of us in this room are, are embracing disciplines at some level. Some of them we've chosen. Some of them have just worked their way into our lives. But Lord, how terrible it would be to be at the end of a life and look back and say, we embraced the wrong disciplines. And that's why I'm so thankful when we look at Matthew 6. Your areas were so clear. Give, give your first money. Have a discipline related to money. Your time. Have a discipline related to time and prayer. Your desire. Have a discipline related to fasting. Scripture. Have a discipline related to Scripture. Not in an attempt to earn your love or affection. We have your love and affection but maybe in an attempt to express our love and affection back. Maybe an attempt to say, I believe, Lord. I believe. And I'm doing this in faith, knowing that you will reward me. Help us to be a congregation of people, a community of people, that put ourselves in environments and culture where your likeness is more greatly formed in us. 
Now I want to ask you to do something just privately, just privately where you are. Ask God to speak to you. Just say, Lord, what is it? Is there a discipline? Is there something that I've been neglecting? Is there an area of my life that lacks faith? Ask him to tell you. I mean, we've had this difficult conversation. Let's not waste it. Is there something, Lord, that you want to use in my family? Speak to me right now. Is there something you want to use in my dorm? Speak to me right now. Is there something that you want to use in my personal integrity? Speak to me right now. Use these disciplines to grow my faith in you. In your name, amen.